I'm very excited that, uh, that we've got Dr. Mike Berg with us today. Dr. Mike Berg, right now, he's a professor of theology at Wisconsin Lutheran College. We brought him in uh, a couple days ago to talk to the university students there uh, because he's got a very strong background in apologetics, uh, particularly. So he's very good at, at bridging apologetics and theology. He's got uh, some uh, graduate work at Biola University where he studied with uh, some very uh, well-known, world-renowned apologists there. And uh, he's a pastor, uh, same church body of us, so he's got the exact same foundational theology uh, as well. But he's been helping to develop coursework and things like that in apologetics in our church body. He's got a summer church program uh, that he's putting together uh, that him and Kerry Keene, who we had last year, Dr. Kerry Keene, they run this summer apologetics seminar. And so, uh, and we we're trying to find some ways of encouraging getting our people over to, maybe a couple of our people to help take classes over there as well. So Dr. Berg also has an awesome podcast called Let the Bird Fly, uh, which has hundreds of episodes on it, uh, very humorous, him uh, and his compadres that do that. Uh, I don't really have anything else to right, say. Dr. You. Berg, thank you very much for thank being you. with us today. <clears throat> Um, I have to say, uh, well, first of all, thank you for having me, but I have to say I'm really disappointed in Canadians. Um, I've been watching the news, and I hear people hoarding toilet paper and all those kinds of things. And I say, this is what we do in America. You're supposed to be better than us. What is wrong with you, right? I was expecting this, you know, this beautiful place of high morality, but I guess sinful nature is sinful nature in Ottawa as it is in Texas. So, anyway. Um, beauty in the theology of the cross. Um, let me start with this. If you said to um, a group of maybe a hundred people and you said, agree or disagree, beauty is in the eye of the beholder. Beauty is in the eye of the beholder. That I'm guessing the vast majority of people would say, oh yeah, I agree with that. And maybe even if they think about it for a while, they would say, yep, I, I agree that beauty is in the eye of the beholder. But that is a change from the way most of history has thought about beauty. Just think about it this way. Think about in terms of location. If beauty is located in my eye, then it seems that location, the location of beauty is not in the object that I see. Now notice how close we are to truth is in the mind of the thinker and not out there, right? So there's a little bit of a problem with that. Let me, let me make it, give you a silly example. So my teenage daughter comes home from school uh, one day and she's in tears and I say, why are you crying, dear? She's too tough for that. She wouldn't, she wouldn't cry, but uh, I would say, uh, why are you crying, dear? And she says, the boys called me ugly today. Now, I have, uh, I have a choice here. Now, um, this is what I'm not supposed to say. I'm not supposed to say, but I think you're beautiful. She doesn't care what daddy thinks at that moment, right? And what if I kind of implied? I say, well, the truth of you being beautiful or not, that's sort of up in the air, but at least the <laughs> consolation is I think you're beautiful. That's not what I'm supposed to say. What am I supposed to say? I'm supposed to say, you are beautiful, and those boys are idiots. Right? That's what I'm supposed to say. You are objectively beautiful. Like, that's not something that is up for debate. It is objective. It's not just in the eye of the beholder. And so for the most of the time, we've kind of, in the history of world, we've kind of put truth and beauty together that they are to be judged objectively. Um, but then there becomes a question, how can we judge? What are the criteria for beauty? Maybe, let me take a step back a little bit and kind of reinforce this. Um, I would go so far as to say that our emotions should be judged objectively as well. Now, I'm not talking about differences like maybe you mourn in a different way, that a culture in the Caribbean is going to mourn in a completely different way than they do in Norway. I'm not talking about those kind of subtle differences. But at the same time, we do judge emotions at the 
as an objective thing. Let me give you another silly example. Let's say I have a boy. I don't have a boy, but let's say he's five years old. And I tuck him into his little race car bed, and I, and I pray, you know, pray with him and say, Jesus loves you. And then I go out into my living room, and there my wife has started a movie, and we're going to watch this movie together. And it's, it's, a, it's an R-rated movie. I don't know if they have the same ratings in Canada, but it has a lot of violence in it. It's like a mob movie or something like that. And in this particular scene, somebody is, I don't know, killing somebody else, like an axe murderer or something like that. And I look up at this bloody scene. I look up, and there around the corner is my son. And he's been watching this. And I jump up, and I say, he's going to have nightmares. I may have to take him to a psychologist. And by the time I get up out of my seat, he points at the television screen and says, <laughs> now I know I have to go to a psychologist, right? <laughs> that was the wrong emotion for that situation. And I think we would all agree that's the wrong emotion for that. So um, emotion and what we sense of beauty, I think, is tied not just to truth but morality. So I'll say to my college kids, I would say, imagine a picture of a and I go way over to the extreme and say a brutal rape. And then a picture of a firefighter bringing down a baby from a burning building. All of you would say, that's beautiful. And all of you would say, that's ugly. And if you didn't, we would have a problem. So here's two pictures. You have Michelangelo's David. You have, um, um, you have the um, <clears throat> um, Goya's um, Saturn devouring his son. Now, this may be beautiful in its technique. It may be beautiful because it says something. But we wouldn't say that, oh, that's a beautiful thing, somebody devouring his own child. In fact, we would be repulsed by that. And what makes that art is precisely because we have a morality, right? It's precise, something shocking because we have a moral, morality. or some piece of art says something about injustice or, or is purposely saying something ugly and it says something to us because, precisely because, we know what's right and wrong, that there is an objective morality. And so I think beauty and truth and morality really are tied together and closer maybe than we think into today's world. So. You may be thinking, oh, this seems very exclusive, but I'll come back to that and try to make the case that it's actually, this is the best case scenario for inclusivity. Now, before we go a little bit um, further, um, you may be also thinking, but what about, what about how I perceive things, right? So does not the, the object that is over there by the time it comes through my senses and in my brain does that not change things and 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 I agree with that to a certain extent right that my perceptions can kind of twist things um, and I need my senses in order to find out truth and beauty and all of those things but I would still come down on the side that beauty and truth and morality are objectively or should be objectively judged. And maybe my perceptions are a little off. Maybe I'm the problem and not the object being the problem. Um, just because I maybe have a different preference than you doesn't give me the right to call something beautiful or ugly. So my youngest daughter, for example, she's not really fond of reading. So she comes home and she has an assignment to read like two or three uh, uh, chapters in a book. And she says, I don't want to do it. And so I try to convince her to do it. And I've been using all of these kinds of ways to try to convince her to do it. I'm arguing with 11 year old and I usually lose, but it's fun. So I do it anyway. So late, late, lately, and uh, I won't go through all my back and forth with her. It's kind of fun, but lately she's saying it's boring. And so then I snipe back, it's not boring, you're boring. I may not be the best parent, right? <laughs> but what I mean by that is this. I know that there are certain things that I don't, I, I don't really like and I call them boring. Like I don't like sci-fi, bores me to tears. 
But there are people who are really into it, and so I say to myself, I think I'm missing something. Like, maybe I'm the boring one. Right? Maybe it's on me, not something out there. Maybe I should give it a chance, kind of thing. And so I say that to her. I say, listen, it's, it, this is about you, you becoming well-rounded and, and being a person that can see joy and beauty and truth and all sorts of different things, right? But she rolls her eyes and she says, it's, it's boring. Then I, I, I don't get angry, but I kind of go, well, who the heck do you think you are? Just judging what's boring, what is not boring. Are you God? You just get to say things like, that's boring, that's beautiful, that's right, that's wrong. I don't think you should have that power, right? And I'm trying to get at her this idea of subjectivity and objectivity, right? Like, she doesn't have a right to say, that's boring. She was never given that position, right? She doesn't get to say that, right? And then she comes up with this cliche, which is the, the last desperate, um, uh, her last desperate move. She says, it's my opinion, right? But I'm trying to pull out of her that your opinion may be wrong, objectively, right? And then finally I say, listen, here's the deal. I'm going to take your phone away until you finish your homework. And that's the only <laughs> thing that works, right? But I'm trying to get at her that these things are objective more than we think about it. We'll come back to the inclusivity and exclusivity just a little bit. Um, here's a passage from Ecclesiastes. He has made everything beautiful in its time. He has also set eternity in the human heart, yet no one can fathom what God has done from beginning to end. And I think this is kind of a good, nice passage of what we're talking about. And maybe I'm pulling it out of context a little bit, but everything beautiful in its time. Like, I don't get to judge that you're ugly or beautiful. This is an objective kind of thing, and I believe it comes from God. Also, he has set eternity in our, in our human heart that he has set us to appreciate beauty and appreciate these big things, right? And so um, when I say something's boring or I don't like that, or I don't modern art, right? No, maybe I'm the one that needs to um, broaden my horizons. And at the same time, no one can fathom what God has done from beginning to end. There are some things that, that, they, that, that I can't quite get, right? And so I do understand that getting to truth, getting to beauty, getting to, to a, an absolute perfect moral ethic or whatever is difficult for us. But that does not negate the fact that there is still something objective out there. So just because it's a confused world, we're not quite sure, doesn't mean we just give up on these pursuits of truth and beauty. On the contrary, I think it makes it very exciting to think about these things even if I'm just having a little conversation with an 11-year-old that's going nowhere. <laughs> it's still kind of fun to think about these things. All right, so how do we know and how can we judge? Um, before I get a little bit further, I, what, what we're talking about here is epistemology. And epistemology is a big word that people like me use to make you feel inferior, but don't be fooled by that. Um, you just look things up in a dictionary, right? And it took me an embarrassingly long time to uh, actually know what epistemology was. Um, um, epistemology is just the study of knowledge. How do we know what we know? How do we get knowledge? That's all that is. And so what we are kind of talking about here is epistemology. How do we get to know and how can we judge things? And I think the history of art goes along with the history of philosophy as we try to ask these questions. So I'm gonna breeze through some, some kind of history of art stuff. It's, it's just one little thing I'm talking about here. I wish I was an art historian, I'm not. And so I'm certainly not, if you're into art, you certainly could add a whole lot more um, to, to, to this discussion. I just noticed something and I wanted to point it out to you. So there's a lot of transitions in art history. Um, Byzantine art, and maybe even uh, kind of what we maybe call old Gothic, although I don't know if I'm right, using the right term there. Think about this as a, a Duccio, uh, Mary Magdalene coming to, um, coming to Jesus. Things are flat. They're two-dimensional. And everybody's got a halo. Like everybody but Judas has a halo, right? It is, it is something that you are, you, 
think about an icon, right? Like this would be an icon of, of Jesus, uh, and maybe you've seen ones that are mosaic. You are pulled into this thing, into something spiritual. So you notice, you're like, this is not like the technique of trying to make this hand look real. The, the artist is not really concerned about making sure that we see that there's knuckles and stuff like that. The point of this painting is religious. It is to pull you into it kind of thing. And it is to give us a religious message. And it tended to be kind of flat and stuff like that, right? Like, there's no landscape that looks like this, right? But this landscape is trying to tell us something about the scene. And it's a theological something that it's telling us. Now notice that truth is from God. And beauty is from God in a certain sense. Um, and it may even be that it can get it can be almost superstitious and we can get kind of maybe into a medieval time where truth is from God that's a good thing that we're thinking about it but it also could be kind of superstitious because it could be anti-rational so why does your why does your village in France have the plague well because God's angry at us clearly right Who's the one who sinned in the in, in our little village kind of thing? Instead of saying, well, maybe there's actually a virus. Or maybe, you know, maybe you should stop throwing your waste in the streets. That would help, right? So it could be the epistemology of that kind of pre-modern, pre-Reformation Renaissance could turn into a little a kind of superstitious kind of thing. And so medieval art, great advances. I mean, just awesome stuff. Um, um, and, but still still very religious in its, in, in, its, in its tone, right? Especially in the West, especially in the West, right? Um, but uh, uh, lots of intricate stuff and using different mediums and stuff like, like that. And a lot of it was to the glory of God, to tell us something about God. When we get into the Renaissance a little bit, we start to get um, kind of a good humanism, where we start to depict humans and humanity and, and pulling stuff from the ancient uh, Greek myths and Roman stories and this kind of stuff. And so you have the birth of, of, of Venice, uh, Venus, which is um, at, the, at the Vatican uh, Museum. And now you start to see uh, the artist is really going into the details of who a, hum who a human being is, right? And so very much concerned about how the eye looks stuff like that right and but it's also telling a story of humanity and this is a rebirth of humans ability to rationalize things and science and all that kind of stuff this is kind of the sweet spot where we're still doing religion but we still have the best of of humanity there but if you've noticed everybody it seems like every uh, painting in the Renaissance is is dramatic like nobody can just stand there everybody's got to have their head tilted Everybody's, in, everybody's being very dramatic, right? And, and you can see that humanity is kind of being lifted up, that the message is not just from God, but there is something about humanity that's unique, right? That tells the stories um, as tragic as sometimes they are. Um, mannerism is, is one uh, technique or uh, kind of a movement within the Renaissance too. And like every, every muscle, we're going to see every muscle. Like I didn't know men had all these muscles, right? You know, and things are going to be elongated, right? Like if Adam, and, if Adam was created this way I, way, I really doubt this is how it looked like, right? You know, and uh, there's stories of like the a pieta, which is like uh, Jesus, uh, Mary, uh, Mother Mary holding Jesus as he is dying. Like he came down from the cross. Like if Mary stood up, she'd be nine feet tall and Jesus would be this small, right? Like if you actually proportion-wise. But they weren't concerned about proportion necessarily. They were concerned about telling a story, right? And even if that story came through myth, right? And that's kind of different than the way we think, doesn't it? About how we get to truth. And then it goes over the top where now we got chubby babies all over the place. We got Baroque and then Rococo and stuff like that, and it's just all a little bit, it's kind of, and when I teach, uh, teach this a little bit in my worship class, I go, I, I show pictures of some um, uh, uh, Baroque or Rococo style churches, and I go, it looks like an upside down birthday cake. Like just, it's just too much all the time, right? 
But then I think we took a step back a little bit. And as we got more scientifically minded and we put away that superstitious past, we stopped really thinking about these stories either from ancient uh, Greece. Uh, they still did that, of course. There was movements within movements like classicalism and stuff like that. But we stopped, we stopped talking about the Jesus stuff and maybe even the mythological stuff. And, and for a while there, it seemed like every artist was just painting bowls of fruit. And it was like a, it was like a competition who, who could make it look real, like realism. And some of this is like, that really, like, that really looks like a pear. Like this, or I'm going to paint a self-portrait, and in that portrait, there's going to be I'm going to be looking at a mirror, and then I'm going to paint myself into a mirror, right? Like just to show off that I can do this, and it's just a, amazing their abilities to depict reality. And I think this went along with epistemology that we are depicting reality. This is how we know stuff through the senses, through the scientific uh, method. Not this superstitious religion kind of mythical stuff, right? And so realism sort of goes along with the academy that was pushing out kind of that religious, what they would call mythological stuff. But artists, they just know. And artists know what the rest of us don't know. And so I, I always found it fascinating that, that, they, that there would be a piece of rotting, you know, there would be just a little piece of that pear that was also starting to rot, you know? Like, like reality's great and all, but sometimes it stinks. <laughs> you know? Like, there's, there's just a, there's just, I, I'm not quite sure that we can explain everything in a material-only worldview, like a purely scientific, like there's no soul, there's no angels, there's no God, there's nothing, uh, we're just atoms bouncing around and chemicals in our brain, and we go, I'm not quite sure. I'm not quite sure that we can just uh, paint um, bowls of fruit over and over and over again, right? And so I wonder, and I don't. I have no proof of this, but I wonder. Then we start to go. We we got all the way to reality. Science. We figured everything out scientifically. This is how we do. We, this is how we do knowledge. We didn't like what we saw. We didn't like what we saw. What we human beings could do. We, to each other with all these technical advances. And already we start to back off on reality a little bit and impressionism and stuff like this. And, and I, I don't know, this is Surat, right? I, I, don't know, I, don't, I don't know enough about art history to go, like, to me I look at that and I go, there's something just a little off there. Like this is not reality. Like this seems too clean and he's maybe telling us this seems too clean. And we start getting a little fuzzy and stuff and then we end up kind of in, you know, all the Picasso's painting and, and cubism and, and what is reality kind of, and then we're going to end up in the surrealism of, of Dali and others. Like we went very, very close to only scientific knowledge. And then we backed off and we say, we don't like that reality so much. There's something else going on. If you think about the history of the world, we, we kind of shoved in the West, we shoved God out. And we figured that we could advance as human beings and we could overcome everything, maybe even death. Oh, we'll maybe have one last great war in the early 20th century, but then after that, everything will be fine and perfect. Um, but it didn't happen, did it? And we couldn't get rid of sin. We couldn't quite figure out the problem of the soul, even if we could figure out how to curb polio and we'll figure out the coronavirus and stuff like that but there's something deeper and I think our artists understand that and the connection with beauty and art and the ability of artists to say this is not right or this is unjust or think about this by shocking us doesn't say that beauty is subjective but precisely that beauty and morality and truth are objective in a certain sense. We may disagree, certainly, from culture to culture and from person to person, but we're still kind of think aiming for something that is objective. Um, so uh, I don't know if that was helpful or not, but that's something that's always struck me. That's always struck me that even as sometimes artists try to try to uh, be um, uh, 
break the mold. We're still talking about beauty and truth and morality in some level. There's an objectivity to it. All right, so then, what is truth and beauty and all of that kind of stuff, right? And I think we should uh, not go too far um, from the concept of God and specifically the logos. So the logos is a Greek word. It's where we get logic from. It's where we get from all the ologies. So if you want to study life, you're going to study biology, right? And so logos can be translated as reason. It can be translated maybe even as order. Um, and it can be translated as it is mostly in our English translations as word. So you know this from John chapter 1. In the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. In the beginning was the logos. And, and I take that more than just the word. I take it as the, the order of all things. And if I know that through all things, all things were made through Jesus, as we hear from St. Paul in, in Colossians, and John is talking about Jesus being this Greek concept of order and stuff like that, I think there's something going on here. Um, Heraclides, you don't know him, but you know him. He's one of those guys you're like, oh yeah, I've heard of him, but I don't know anything. But he's the guy that said, you can't step in the same river twice, right? Things are moving so much. And he seems to be saying, like, we have no concept of truth. We can't get to truth because from moment to moment, things have changed so much that there's no, there's nothing, there's no standard, right? There's no standard. But what Heraclitus actually said was, yeah, it's tough because the river is always moving, but don't listen to me, listen to the Lagos this kind of concept in Greek uh, culture that there was still an order, a reason, a logos, something out there. The reason up is up and down is down, and two plus two equals four and not three. Now Heraclides worked in the, the area of Ephesus, and if you, you know, we're, we're pretty sure, well, we know for sure that John, the gospel writer, about, I don't know, 400 years later, also worked in Ephesus, and so you know, around that Ephesus, they, they would have known one of their famous fathers, Heraclides, right? You know, like we still have statues of people that, you know, from 100, 200, 300 years ago. And so I, I, I can't prove it, but I, I, really, I really think that when John began his gospel writer, he had this in mind when he said, in the beginning was the Logos. And so what he was saying to his Greek audience, who was trying to say, yes, there's this Lugus out there, this mystical thing that sort of orders things, but down here, boy, it just seems like things are in flux all the time. John comes and says, your Lugus, I met him. I met him. I shook his hand. He's a person. And that would just have blown away the idea uh, of the Greeks because gods and pa that was up there. To come down in the nitty and the gritty was kind of a, was kind of a, that that would be a, a too low of a thing for their gods kind of thing. We still see that today, right? Um, for one of the biggest criticisms Islam has to Christianity is your God became man? How could that be? How could you believe in such a weak God? And so the eternal Lagos flips everything upside down. And I think Jesus is the, is the reason why up is up and down is down and one plus one equals two and not three. And so to me then, he is also the truth. In fact, didn't he say that? I am the truth and I am the way. And I, I, I wonder, we don't have everything that Jesus uh, said. Maybe one time he said, I am the beauty. <laughs> Maybe, I don't know. But he said, I am the truth and I am the way. The truth is a person. Love is a person. And that kind of blows our mind, doesn't it? But it's out of love that it's not something up there. I don't have to climb a high mountain to find some sort of enlightenment. I don't need gold and silver. I don't need a very keen mind. Because my God comes down into the mud and the blood and the beer. As I say, a little Johnny Cash in here. So that he's right next to me. He hides behind these masks. All of this kind of stuff that I know your pastors have talked about. So, this kind of a side note too, but when we think about beauty, and, and, and people have, um, we want to put everything into a like kind of an algorithm or mathematical equation because that's how we think we get to truth. 
the only way to truth is kind of an objective sort of mathematical thing or something that we prove in a laboratory, right? The, the artist and the poet, they're just playing, right? This is kind of our modern, our modern mindset. But even then, we see that beauty is, tends to be objective, right? Have you ever heard, like, you know, uh, if you give people a bunch of faces to look at and rate them as beautiful and not, um, that people who are uh, symmetrical, <laughs> those are the ones that we are attracted to, right? Like if your one eyeball's up here and the other one's up here, probably you're not going to be considered very beautiful, right? And it's to the point where the more precise you are, s s you like in, in symmetry, the more beautiful you're considered, and that's across most cultures. Um, if you're into math, if you're a mathematician, uh, there's certain numbers that are beautiful, like things fit together, right? There's mathematical equations that you say this is, like a flower is a flower. Why is it beautiful? Because it's mathematically beautiful. It is, right? I mean, people have thought about this stuff. And so I wonder if order, and I read their morality, then connects ourselves to beauty, right? Like I said, um, you, 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 a, a, a vicious rape we would call ugly, a uh, heroic sacrifice we call beauty. In fact, there, there, it's kind of a myth that um, that uh, young women like bad boys, or young men like those wild girls. Like we've done some testing on that, where you're actually attracted to somebody who is seemingly more moral than you and pure. Like we're attracted to purity, we're attracted to order. We're attracted to peace, usually speak, most, most of the time. Right? And so I think there is a connection with math that is connected with art, for sure, that's connected with beauty. It's, it's almost as if there was one orderer, right, who put this into a mathematical way of thinking, this world, right? It, it makes sense mathematically, but also ordered morality and ordered beauty. I think. I think John did us a great service when he said, in the beginning was the Lugus. And the Lugus was with God. And the Lugus was God. And a little bit later, and the Lugus came down here and lived among us. I met him, and you get to hear from him too. Right? This is really kind of, it's kind of mind-blowing when you think about it. Yeah. All right. Now to the theology of the cross. But when I look at Jesus, in fact, Isaiah the prophet said in, in 53, chapter 53, Jesus, he doesn't, he doesn't know the name Jesus. He's talking about the suffering servant, which we identify as a prophecy of Jesus. He grew up before him like a tender shoot and like a root out of dry ground. He had no beauty. <laughs> Jesus had no beauty. The, the suffering servant had no beauty or majesty to attract us to him. Nothing in his appearance that we should desire him. So here beauty is kind of connected, or at least it's set up this way as there's, there's an interaction, there's a feeling like beauty. And, and many philosophers have talked about this. Beauty has to, means that I have, a, I have a feeling in me, which is as fine as far as it goes, but it's a little bit subjective, right? Like I can feel differently than you can, right? And so beauty can't be judged by this. But what, what the prophet is saying is that there is nothing that makes us feel, yes, I want to be, I want to follow the guy dying on a cross. Right? Um, this is beautiful, and I, I choose the picture of the firefighter um, and his self-sacrifice of going up and, and saving the baby from a burning building. And I don't choose this ugly thing over here. Because Jesus is the ugly thing. Jesus is the curse. He would have been deformed so much that he would have been almost unrecognizable. And, and in that world, that person was a curse. He got what he deserved. I'm willing to bet that he was stripped naked too, just to embarrass him. Just to embarrass him. Nobody would have said, I followed this guy, right? So we got this issue with the theology of the cross, right? That we've kind of said, okay, maybe there's a concept of objective beauty and morality with God and the Logos and all this kind of stuff. And then where we're supposed to focus in on Jesus the most 
that's when he's the most ugly. When he has no beauty or majesty that would attract us to himself. And so the theology of the cross is, uh, has an epistemolog epistemological thing to say to us. Um, maybe we can just talk about the theology of the cross in a very basic way right now. The theology of the cross says this, that we go by what God says, and that sometimes does not necessarily go with what we see. So, um, I can look at a good work. Let's just take Mother Teresa, right? Everybody says Mother Teresa does a lot of good works. So Mother Teresa has all of these good works, and you have some good works too, and they're good, and they outwardly look beautiful. And maybe if, if you, you, know, you play kind of humble and you're like, oh, shucks, you know, I didn't, I, you know, I'm, I'm not, I didn't, it's just my, my joy to help out or whatever. But in your, in your heart, you've polished them up like trophies. You have them on your mantle. Huh? Right? Let's be honest. If these outwardly good acts that maybe did great things for the world, if they become your idols that you trust, so that, so that when you meet God, you're like, here's my trophies. See, I was a good little boy or girl. See, I did better than everybody else. Right? Those outwardly good things are pure evil. And why are they pure evil? Because they work against faith. If the goal is trusting in God, and for one second I start to trust myself, that's not where I need to be. If I trust myself and I go before God and I go, judge me for my life, this is a bad situation for us to be in. Right? Because we will be judged for our lives. And so we want to despair of our own, our own lives and trust God that he was righteous in our place and then this guy died on the cross to pay the price for our sins, right? I mean, we all, I think we all agree that's the message of the Bible. So those good deeds may actually be evil if they start making me trust in myself and not God. So what is good, God says evil. On the other hand, I get cancer. And <clears throat> that's evil. It is evil. It's heinous. It's terrible. But if that suffering in my life finally is the nail in the coffin of my self-righteousness, where I stop trusting in myself, and the doctor's got nothing for me, and the government can't do anything, and, and I got friends like Job had friends. I got nothing, and I go, finally, I just got to trust, and I fall on my knees, and I trust God. That outwardly evil thing was good. So I sometimes call good evil and evil good. If you were a first century Palestinian person of any race or ethnicity within the Roman Empire, the vast Roman Empire, and you saw on a main street someone dying in a horrific, cursed way, you would not say, that's good. And that first Good Friday, you would have not called good. But God called it good. That that sacrifice, as heinous as it looks, is for the eternal good for so many. So what I see, right, may be something different than what God says it. And I think that's the core of the theology of the cross, at least when it comes to epistemology. How do I know? I don't turn my brain off. I still see things, I still think about things, but finally I go with what God says it is. I take God at his word. By the way, let's think about words just for a second. Um, uh, I tell my students, uh, I teach like the lowest level Bible, like the freshmen come in here, you know, and I'm like, take out a pencil, this is college now, kind of, kind of students. And uh, I start out with Genesis chapter one in this class. And I say, on the test, I'm going to ask you, the first question is, how did God create the heavens and the earth? And you better not say with his power. You're going to answer with his words. 
And right from the beginning, I say, this is about words. This is a story, a real story. And throughout the Old Testament and the New Testament, it's going to be about God speaking and the people either taking him at his word or ignoring his word. And when they ignore his word, it's often because they trust their sight rather than taking God at his word. Everything's going to be about, take me at my word. Even when I say, that's good, even though it looks bad. So the theology of the cross, how do you live the theology of the cross? I, I think um, what we would, we would say is that there are two, there's two glasses that you can put on. So I'm thinking, I'm looking through the, through the world through these lenses. The one is a theology of glory. So I look at the world and I see that's good. God must have blessed me. Right? So I look at my bank account, I look at your bank account, and we figure out who God likes better. Right? This is the prosperity gospel. Right? Um, you know who the, who the classic theologian of glory was? Was the pre-Pentecost St. Peter. You guys have probably heard in the last a few weeks Transfiguration, the story of the Transfiguration, where Jesus is up praying with Peter, James, and John on a mountain, and all of a sudden, Moses and Elijah are there from heaven. And what does Peter want to do? Peter wants to set up three tents. Why? He wants to bottle up the glory. Let's keep this heavenly glory here on earth. Let's set up three tents. Maybe we'll sell tickets. Right? But what does he say? He says, the power and glory of heaven. There's no way anybody would deny you now, Jesus. Right? Like, this is so good for the cause. Right? This is great. And then the glory's gone, and Jesus goes down the mountain, and we're told in Luke 9 that, um, at, first of all, he tells the disciples, don't tell anybody what you saw. And then he says... We're, res he, we're told that he resolutely set out to Jerusalem and that was for his passion. He says, don't you understand that the Son of Man must suffer many things? Right? So Peter had the lens of glory on. This is very rational. If people see this miracle, then of course they're going to believe and this is going to be good for the cause. But how many times had Jesus performed miracles and people just ignored it? Did not the Pharaoh in Egypt seek quite a bit of God's glory. It's not about a rational decision. It's about trust. Taking God at his word. Right? So, the theologian of glory, Peter, still hasn't learned his lesson. So he's cutting off ears in Gethsemane. He's doing all these things that seem to be full of glory that make sense. But when, when it comes to the time of confessing and trusting his God, he runs away on Monday, Thursday night because he's afraid of what? A girl. Whose only accusation of him is, I think you know Jesus. <laughs> and he runs away. By the way, Peter's kind of a fraud and he's kind of, he's kind of a down on himself until he's given the Spirit at Pentecost. All the way through the Gospels, he's still a little shaky. Um, even when he sees Jesus alive on the Sea of Galilee, he needs the Spirit, he needs trust, he needs faith. So a theologian of glory looks at, in this very rational way, so somebody is blessed, God must love them, or um, if we just did this in the church, if we just had a little bit more money or the right leadership or the right worship or whatever, then this, everything will turn around and I, I just can't understand why we're not doing that. And this is, you know, if I was in charge, then, the, the, you know, uh, me and Peter were in charge, then the, the church would just explode. Um, this is a theologian of glory's glasses, but a theologian of the cross puts on the glass uh, of the cross and sees everything through the prism of the cross and we see that something that was so ugly and awful and terrible was actually good. So now I look at my life and I even can find in suffering something meaningful 
and good, right? And so we did this on Friday night, but let me just do a little thing about Job real quick to kind of hammer the point, point home. If the goal is faith in God, I think we'd all agree, the goal is faith in God. And the opposite of trusting God is trusting in something else, usually myself, right? Then it seems to me that God needs to beat the false piety out of me once in a while. So I can rejoice in my sufferings because God is pushing me away from myself. You ever think about Doubting Thomas, right? I love this story of Doubting Thomas that we get the Sunday after Easter. Underrated Sunday. Everybody goes to Sunday on, on Easter Sunday and they're like, well, it's time, it's after Lent, it's time for a break, and they don't come to the second. Go the second Sunday of Easter. That's the story of Doubting Thomas. It's so great. And I love the story of Doubting Thomas being in a room with closed doors and locked windows. He has nowhere to go. And by the way, what did he want? He wanted empirical evidence. He said, unless I see where the nail marks here, here are, the, and where the spear went into his side, I won't believe that Jesus was alive. Uh, Michelangelo Caravaggio has a great painting of that scene. I, instead of like kind of a, um, a Byzantine early uh, or medieval, uh, you know, where Jesus has got a halo and he's pointing to his side and Thomas is like, oh, now I believe. Um, Caravaggio has Jesus grabbing Thomas at the wrist and shoving it into his side. Stop doubting your belief. You want proof? I'll give you proof. Right? Kind of throws him away, right? <laughs> I think that was probably more accurate, right? But the point was Thomas was put into a corner where he had nowhere to go. He had to trust Jesus. Like, I got cornered by God. I think Job got cornered by God. I don't know if Job needed it like Thomas, but he got cornered by God where he had nowhere to go but to trust in God. So I have this feeling that there are times when, um, well, as a pastor, when I had somebody who come in, you know people like this, like they just cannot catch a break. Like it's just one thing after another. Some of it's their fault, some of it's not their fault. You know people like this and, and your heart goes out to them. And I said to one of this one man, recovering cocaine addict, um, all around kind of job to bounced from job to job all around kind of loser and he knew it was a truck driver and it wasn't his fault but he got into an accident uh, was laid up in the hospital for a couple months lost his job and the people that he hit uh, um, the, everybody in the car died and he's feeling this guilt even though it wasn't his fault and so we're meeting over and over and over again and, and I told him once I said you know I don't worry about you in your faith, not once. Even though he, he was not really a good churchgoer. I worry about the people where they they the people that seem to have their act together that are very successful. Those are the people I worry about their faith. I don't worry about the people who suffer. Because they're exactly where they need to be to trust. They're not tempted by trusting themselves in the world. So let me do this little bit here. Um, so Job chapter 1, um, the devil and God are talking, which is just right away blows my mind. And uh, uh, God says, um, it seems that maybe the devil has kind of said, nobody likes you in the world. And God says, but Job's a righteous man. He loves me. And the devil says, of course he loves you. He's got all this. He's got a good reputation. He's got a lot of money. He's got a great family and all that kind of stuff. You let me at him, and he'll curse you and die. And this is the most fascinating thing in, uh, in, the, in, in the Old Testament to me, where uh, God says, okay, but don't take his life. So the health is stripped away from Job, all these things, his wealth, his family, all that stripped, and he does not curse God and die. In fact, out of that mine of pressure on a piece of coal comes a diamond we still sing today in Easter. I know that my Redeemer lives, and in the end I'll stand upon the earth. Huh? Right? I mean, isn't that, isn't that great? So, if we can be a little bit flippant here, um, let's say that uh, the devil and God have a monthly staff meeting. So they're talking, right? And God says, uh, what about my people in St. Paul's, Ottawa? They love me. And God says, 
See, see how beautiful a city they live in? How much money they got? Are you kidding me? Of course they like you. You take that away and they'll curse you and die. And I have a feeling that God and, and, and uh, the devil go through the roster list here. And they go, God says, can't touch her checkbook, but she can lose her health. Uh, don't take her life, um, um, but everything else. He, um, financial ruin would be okay, um, but not this. He just goes to him. Knowing that your faith will be stronger for it in the end. Like he knows what, what's going on. I have no doubt believing that that's somehow true in some way or form. And I bet that maybe you haven't put all the puzzle pieces together and probably never will into heaven, but I bet that a lot of you have looked back on your life and you go, that at the moment was the most terrible thing in the world and I wondered if God, God cared at all. But boy, was that the right thing for me at that time. And it took decades to figure out. It may take heaven to figure out. But notice how beautiful this is, that with if I'm looking at the world with the, the lenses of the cross, that what I see with my lenses of glory may, may be empirically true, but may not be spiritually true. And I put on the lens of the cross and I say, okay, God says this is good, even if it looks something different, because I'm looking through the prism of the cross. That's a game changer for you. Because that means that you cannot freak out all the time about suffering and about pain. And if for no other reason, and we've got to be careful here that we are not trying to look into the will of God, but it may be for no other reason than there is suffering in my life that he is just reminding me, don't trust in yourself. So you may, but I'm trusting in God right now, and then something bad happens, right? And you're like, why did I need that? Because he didn't want you to take that next step, which is to start trusting yourself. And maybe, maybe, maybe that's the only reason why you got cancer. I don't know for sure, but I can, as a pastor, say to you, let's put on the glasses of the cross. And that looks ugly, but God's going to make it look beautiful. Right? So the theology of the cross then um, gives us kind of a concept of beauty that maybe the rest of the world doesn't. It's not just a feeling, right? That's beautiful because I, it makes me feel nice inside. Um, and, and, and it's tied to truth and it's tied to morality. It's not just my preference. It's something bigger and badder and something, something very epic and big. Right? And I also get to see that sometimes something that is ugly actually is most beautiful. So this is Matthias Grunewald's. I've, I've been having the privilege to see this in, in person. This is a picture of Jesus' crucifixion. 1400s, I think, was Matthias Grunewald. And this was a depiction of Jesus in a chapel that was in... Um, um, I don't know what they would have called it during that, but a, a leprosarium where they, they put the lepers. Like, you know, you're quarantined. Um, here's the hospital where you're going to die. Um, and there was a chapel in there. And so what Matthias Grunewald painted, uh, when he painted Jesus, he painted him with a skin disease. Right? So these people who are dying of skin diseases, they would look up and they would see Jesus suffering with them. And, and, and Matthias Grunewald, I mean, this is gross, right? I mean, this is not, this is, you look at that and you go, I don't want to look at that every morning. This is something different, right? I mean, just look at the fingers and stuff and, and all that. It's grotesque and purposely so. But for those dying of skin disease, this is the most beautiful picture in the world because it means that they're going to have a perfect resurrected body forever. So the cross as ugly as it is, is beautiful and makes my ugly life beautiful. That's a game changer. Right? And so not only do we have Jesus who is the Lugas, who is the orderer, who says, this is right, this is beauty, this is order, and we're naturally attracted to that kind of stuff. 
but he also comes down here and loves us enough to take what is most ugly and makes it beautiful so that our lives um, are not lost. And our lives are not just, here's good, here's bad, hopefully we have more good than bad, but the whole thing is redeemed by Christ. The whole thing is in the hands of God. So true inclusivity, I, I'm willing to bet that when, you, when I started my little silly speech here and I said, uh, beauty is objective and should be judged so, the first question was, who gets to judge so? And I hopefully I've at least made a case that, uh, that you could consider God makes it so, right? But doesn't this seem very exclusive? But I think it's actually true inclusivity. Because if we each have an opinion about truth and beauty, then we are really excluding others. Even if we tell ourselves that we're including others, we're really saying, uh, this is my opinion and your opinion's wrong, like my daughter. Right? She says, that's boring, and I get to declare it's not boring. Or I get to declare it's boring, it's on me. Right? She has excluded everybody else who thinks that it's not boring. So if beauty is objective, then I have no right to say that's ugly or whatever. But right now I'm more inclusive to say, I, I may not prefer that, but I, don't, I, can, I am forced to say that that actually is beautiful. And I start to see different people in a more inclusive way. And I say, maybe I don't think that person is beautiful. I'm not just talking about looks, but, but their soul or whatever. And I may say, I'm not attracted to that person's personality, and maybe I go, I gotta check myself. I bet you there's something very beautiful about that soul. Right? Because that's objectively beautiful, not just because I have said that it's beautiful. And so I think we can really even tie this to human rights and how we treat each other. That everybody has some beauty in them, right? And, and that we should be open to that. And so I think the final message is this. We tend to go by sight, but God says, take me at my word, and you will be more loving, and you will see beauty, and you will be more fulfilled. Trust me on this. I'll even take something really ugly like this, and I'll make it beautiful for you. All right? I think I'm out of time, so thanks for having me. I appreciate you giving me your attention for an hour or so. Yeah.